All right, let's start. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tomáš Hoza. Uh, I've been a federal contributor for over than uh, for more than uh, three years, and I've been mostly working on DNS-related stuff and network systems. <coughs> so today, I'd like to uh, explain you DNSSEC uh, from high level and the uh, changes we are trying to make in Fedora. So let's start. Uh, during this presentation, I'll cover why DNS important, is important and why we should care. Uh, what is the change in Fedora all about? Uh, how it works? And what are the, what is the integration in Fedora products? Uh, workstation, server, cloud, and not everything is finished yet, but what are our plans? So, why is DNSSEC important? Hopefully, all of you know what DNS is. It's a distributed database that is able to store various type of types of data, most usually IP addresses, and is used for translating name, domain names to IP addresses, but that's not the only thing you can store in DNS. You can store also different types of data, uh, for example, so as I call them trusted data, data you can uh, use for verification of for example, certificates or remote host fingerprints and stuff like that. So, for example, TLSA uh, resource record can use for uh, verifying uh, remote host TLS certificate. Uh, SSH fingerprint you can use uh, for verifying remote host uh, SSH fingerprint. So you don't have to be uh, tasked to answer if that fingerprint presented by the remote host is really the one it should be. So it can be verified by the SSH client automatically. IPsec keys, uh, for example, I know Paul is trying to do some opportunistic VPN tunnels and stuff like that. So in ideal world, uh, if you are trying to connect to some remote uh, server, first you would look up IPsec keys of, those, of that server, uh, create a tunnel, that server would uh, look up your IPsec keys and you can start uh, communicate uh, like uh, over tunnels. Uh, then uh, there is the third uh, resource record you can use for example for storing uh, PGP uh, uh, certificates and there is the certification authority authorization resource record you can use for like uh, restricting which uh, uh, certification authorities are uh, uh, can issue certificates for your uh, domain. So this opens uh, possibilities for new kinds of applications, like I said, like opportunistic VPNs, uh, uh, VPN tunnels, uh, then uh, uh, SSH clients can automatically verify the remote hosts, uh, <coughs> fingerprint, and so on. <coughs> but with plain DNS, it doesn't make sense to get those data from from DNS database because with plain DNS there is no that data integrity mechanism and no data authenticity mechanism. So plain DNS is vulnerable and suffers from various types of attacks, main the middle attacks, cache poisoning attacks, spoofing attacks, and so on. And also uh, in usual situation DNS. Uh, works over uh, UDP, so it is really easy to uh, spoof the client's IP address or, or server's IP address. So uh, this is why DNS, uh, DNSSEC uh, was introduced. It stands for DNS Security Extensions. It's just an extension of uh, DNS protocol, so uh, all the implement implementations that don't have DNSSEC implemented should just ignore all those extra data in the responses and all those ex extra flags. Uh, DNSSEC provides uh, data authenticity and integrity uh, in uh, DNS world, and it uses uh, asymmetric cryptography. Basically, uh, all the data when you are using DNSSEC are signed using uh, as uh, asymmetric cryptography and keys, and then uh, you can verify the server responses using uh, by building a chain of trust from the root zone uh, and by using the well-known root uh, key used by the root servers so you can build the chain of trust from root zone to the host name you are trying to 
resolve and verify that the response is really the one it should be and that no one messed with the response. Or you can find out that uh, there is no such uh, domain name and uh, you can be sure that this is the response from the authoritative server. So now we know why is this important to have the DNSSEC. So what's the change all about? We are trying to focus on the client side uh, and by that I mean the application's client side. Everything works pretty nicely on the server side but when it comes to, to for example, uh, mobile, uh, mobile machines and, and clients, uh, there is really not that much support uh, built in into applications. So we are trying to basically uh, integrate uh, multiple components on the system so they can be installed by default in Fedora and provide some, some extra security. Uh, these components must uh, respond uh, to different uh, network configuration changes and do some other stuff. Uh, so we are trying to have a local validating resolver on the system installed by default and running by default. Uh, this will allow us to provide some extra security from DNS point of view to the applications then they, that don't even care. For example, your web browser. It doesn't have to fetch any like trusted data from, from DNS, but even though it can be sure that your internet banking uh, domain name was uh, translated to the right IP address and it was very fun. Uh, applications that do care, like uh, SSH uh, client or if the browser wants to do the TLS uh, certificate uh, verification using the TLS A record, they should use preferably some uh, validating DNS API, for example, get DNS or leave unbound or something else. Because uh, you, you, can, you could rely on the locally running uh, validating resolver, but uh, you can never be sure or can make sure that there is such a resolver running and that it was configured properly and uh, all the libraries you are using, for example, GVPC is kind of broken in the, in, from DNS point of view. So if you do care about security, preferably you should use some, some better API for DNS. So how it works in Fedora? Uh, in Fedora, we are using uh, three main components. Network Manager, uh, since it's used by default in Fedora, as a Network Configuration Manager. Uh, we use it as for notifications about network configuration changes and for all the data about current network configuration. Then there is the Unbound Server, which is validating DNS Resolver. It's used for basically for the name resolution and it does the validation. Unbound is uh, kind of special because it was developed with DNSSEC in mind for, from the beginning and its purpose is to be like not a Swiss knife as a DNS mask but rather just a resolver solving its purpose. Then there is a DNSSEC trigger. Uh, DNSSEC trigger is a kind of integration component between Unbound and Network Manager. It does uh, it uh, oh, dynamically reconfigures uh, unbound base on the current network uh, configuration. So uh, you can imagine like a network measure on the top, which uh, on every network configuration change notifies DNSSEC trigger that there is some change. DNSSEC trigger uses uh, standard uh, network measure provided uh, library to fetch all the current network configuration from it and it tries to figure out if it should reconfigure unbound in any way. It uh, gathers, for example, default configuration, default connections, what are the DNS servers provided by the default connection, if there are any VPNs, what are the domains provided with those VPNs, name servers, and so on. DNS trigger then, when it gets all the data, it does some, uh, performs various tests, for example, to be for Unbound to be able to do the validation, it needs to be configured properly with proper set of uh, 
DNS servers. Those DNS servers have to be able to provide all the data necessary for the validation. So this is what DNS uh, set trigger uh, tests for. If those network provided uh, DNS servers are capable of providing all the data that are necessary. If this is not the case, it can try if it's possible to uh, reach uh, authoritative servers on the internet. If that's not possible, it can try if it's if it can uh, contact uh, federal infrastructure uh, because in federal in federal infrastructure we have DNS resolvers running on uh, TCP port 80 and also on uh, uh, port 443 uh, and they are using SSL. So it tries to tunnel all the DNS communication to the federal infrastructure. If that's not possible, it should basically inform the user that something is really broken. Uh, then, when all those tests are performed, Unbound is reconfigured, so it reflects the current network configuration. So, currently, we support a split DNS view and VPNs, so if you connect to your VPN and the VPN provides you different set of name servers and some domains and the VPN is not configured to be used for all resources but just for the resources from the VPN network it configures uh, special forward zones in unbound so that VPN provided name servers are used only for VPN from the domain from the VPN then we are configuring uh, Forward zones also for uh, for uh, I, private IP network ranges, so uh, you are able to do the uh, reverse uh, resolution of IP addresses. Uh, then we have a couple of fallback mechanisms, like I said, uh, full recursion, and then DNS over TCP or SSL. Basically, you are you can set up your own infrastructure if you don't trust federal infrastructure, but uh, by default, there is, we are using federal infrastructure for that. There is also upstream infrastructure like, uh, the ups from the upstream of DNS trigger. Okay, so what's the integration in Fedora? In Fedora, we have different products for some time, and those products have a different uh, audience. Uh, therefore, after some pretty pretty long discussions on Fedora level, list, uh, we figure out that we need to provide specific product specific configurations because GNOME folks were not really happy about the, the changes and the user interface DNS trigger provided. Also, we figure out that there are a couple of integration points we need to solve and that may be solved differently in different products. For example, captive portal detection, captive portal handling, login handling, and then the user interaction. So what are the common things? In the beginning, there was a DNS trigger panel that was not really user friendly, but it worked and it was installed by default. Fedora workstation product didn't like it, so we split it into separate uh, sub package, so it's not installed by default. And we made some changes so that we don't need to do any extra user interaction, but we left everything up to the GNOME shop. Then uh, captive portal detection is now turned off, uh, currently only in Fedora workstation, but uh, it, it will be most probably turned off uh, on every uh, product and every variant. We will rely on Network Manager because Network Manager is doing basically exactly the thing, maybe something more that DNS Trigger was doing when detecting the captive portal. And for that, we will need some notifications on connectivity state changes from Network Manager. That's not yet available, but Network Manager developers promise to provide this functionality. So like uh, Network Manager, Dispatcher notifies you on network uh, configuration changes. It will notify also on connection state changes. For example, if the internet is reachable or if there is a captive portal and so on. So Fedora board session. We 
completely turned off the captive portal detection login functionality because Notion already uh, implements this and uh, basically it didn't work real well because there were some race conditions. Uh, we are doing no user interaction but uh, we want to provide some way to easily configure some notifications if you really want to. GNOME uh, developers don't want to bother users with some notifications that may confuse them or the user may not even understand what does it mean. For example, when all the fallback uh, options failed and we are switching to some kind of insecure mode from the NSF point of view, the user may not understand like what are the implications and may get scared, stuff like that. So therefore we also to not to get rid of the need to for user interaction when the, all the fallback options fail, we got rid of the basically UI for that and we are doing the automatic switch to insecure mode if all fallback options fail. This is basically the switch to insecure mode means that you are basically in the state that is currently in Fedora. So we are not doing any DNS validation. So does the user have any way of knowing that they've fallen back into? So so is yeah. there is like if I'm if I'm a user of Fedora workstation and I think I'm on I'm using DNSSEC and then you know I walk to a cafe or whatever and something fails and we go back to insecure mode. Yeah. And I just <coughs> actually, using actually, sec, but actually, uh -huh. actually we as the change developers we think that users should be informed. But <laughs> okay. GNOME developers have like different opinion about this. But by uh, introducing the possibility to automatically switch to insecure mode because DNSSEC trigger didn't have that before, I I also added an uh, option to <coughs> run some command on switch to insecure mode. So it is easily possible and it would, will be like commented out in the configuration to send a notification window to GNOME shell so you can be notified like, yeah, now I switch to, to insecure mode. And the insecure mode uh, automatic switch can be like disabled so it will not happen at all. Yeah. And, and the applications will actually know because they're not getting the DNSSEC data anymore. Mm. So they'll actually know that something's wrong. If they care, they will know. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe we'll figure out some, some good notification that is digestible for the user and also for GNOME developers. But right now we agreed not to do any notification, which is not really good from our point of view, but you know everything silently fails and you you are losing the security. Yeah, but it doesn't seem like a priority for workstation. So for cloud, uh, we basically just started the uh, discussions. We think that uh, the trusted resolver makes sense at least on the host where you are running containers, because uh, containers running on that host can reuse the locally running resolver and get the extra security even though they don't care or are not aware of it. So for, uh, for sure it doesn't make sense to have a like, local resolver on the images themselves because you don't want each container to run a separate resolver. The problem is that Docker currently is not able to use the locally running resolver. It works in a way that if, if, your, if the host resolve conf contains some IP address uh, different from a local host, uh, the Docker will copy the IP addresses to the containers resolve conf, but if there is local host address, it will put the, uh, Google's DNS server's IP addresses into containers <laughs> resolve conf, which is basically the <laughs> easiest way to solve this, and it works. But it's not the most clever thing to do. Does it do all local hosts? Or like if you were to change 1.7001 to 1.27002? I think it's like uh, 
one to seven slash okay. eight, so yeah. anything from the <coughs> subnet is basically ignored. We proposed like uh, some easy hack uh, using IP table rules uh, to forward or all the uh, like DNS queries to the local from, from containers to the locally running resolver, but the upstream wants to solve it in a more proper way by implementing some DNS proxy and they are not really sure when this will be available or how this will work. It's, uh, the communication is kind of slow and we are not sure like uh, how to solve it uh, in Fedora without the upstream really including the, the fix for now. So the common uh, discussion is still ongoing. For the server, there is the question of configuration. In the server environment, you don't have that many like uh, network configuration changes, and most probably everything is statically uh, configured. So the DNS trigger part may not uh, make sense in server, but if you use it, you get like the value of not having to manually configure anything because it will automatically configure unbound even though it will be just once when you boot up the server. And also there is the DNS trigger control uh, tool that substitutes the user interface in, on, in command line interface, in command line, and that's usable for, for getting data, like what's the state, how is, uh, what are the outcomes of the test performer by DNS trigger, and basically for switching to, to different uh, modes. Uh, this tool is uh, included by default on, on any product, but it makes more sense in environments where the command line tool is uh, like uh, the most, ba most usual way of interacting with the system. So for other variants, uh, for example, as I said, Gongshell provides some user interaction and uh, hotspot login functionality, but for other variants, some spins that don't provide this, uh, it will be necessary to install the DNS trigger panel sub-package for the user interaction. And as for the rest, it should be all the same as for other products. Uh, so, to summarize, DNS trigger on client side opens new possibilities. Like I said, you can store some special data in DNS and write or enhance your client applications to use those data to, for example, validate uh, remote host uh, certificate or some fingerprint or to build some VPN tunnel to the host. Uh, the changes we are doing are mostly consisting of a tightly integrated set of components, network manager, unbound and DNS trigger. We are providing different configuration for workstation, but we are open to like uh, suggestions. If there are other things that should be different, we can provide different for, uh, configuration also for other products or variants. Yeah, uh, I also for, I basically I forgot to mention that by using DNSX, some, some dirty hacks that were commonly used with plain DNS will stop working. For example, if you used, uh, in the past, if you used just Network Manager and you connected to VPN, Network Manager put the VPN and DNS servers uh, on the first place in the resolve call. So e even though the VPN was configured to be used only for the resources from that VPN network, uh, those VPN provided DNS servers were used for all DNS queries. So this was privacy leaking, basically, but it worked. So if you didn't list all your domains uh, when you uh, connected to the VPN, it worked in that way, but now it will stop working because if you don't uh, list specifically uh, all domains from the VPN, those uh, queries not from the listed, from domains that are not listed, uh, will not be forwarded to the VPN. Also, also some like uh, 
if you connect uh, to some bike buy on on airport and they are using their uh, like own top level domain that doesn't exist it will usually it will not work because they are basically making up their own records that don't exist so you, you can get like uh, cryptographic proof of non-existence of that top level domain but they are still still claiming that there is such a domain so if you're using DNSSEC this is basically an attack so you will not trust their answer I like that <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. Yeah, so, so <laughs> that's a good thing, but uh, you know, a lot of users are used to uh, things working, and by introducing new countermeasures for security, you are breaking those things that was were basically misconfigurations or misinterpretations Hacks. of Hacks. yeah yes. RFCs or. But now for $180,000, you too can have your own top level domain. Right, so why not to buy them? So I would like to ask you to test the NSEC trigger if you didn't uh, yet in Fedora and provide us some, some uh, use cases for which it doesn't work for you. Not all use cases you had uh, may be valid. So <laughs> we will tell you that <laughs> you, you should change your configurations. So hopefully there will be some place where I can share the slides with you so we can go through some links on Fedora Wiki if you are interested in some design documents we put together after having to explain over and over and over and over again like what is DNSSEC all about and what is the change all about and why we think it's important and stuff like that. So that's basically everything from my side. So on your, when you were talking about the cloud host, so are you saying that the DNSSEC result wouldn't be included in the cloud image? I, I think it doesn't make sense to, to include it in the image. Yeah, but I agree. I just want to make sure that that's not in play. Because the, the way it's been presented on the mailing list, it seems like you guys are trying to put, you know, on down and down the DNSSEC trigger in the cloud image as well as in, like, atomic host, which I don't think makes any sense. Actually, I don't think there was uh, any previous discussion, but uh, um, just this week, uh, BJP sent some email to Fedora Cloud mailing list. And to be honest, I didn't go through the email. But if he claimed that we should include it everywhere, that's not the truth. That's not true. No, yes. What I understood was that there, on all containers it would not be included because then if you run a thousand containers on one host, you're running a thousand times these demons, which is completely unnecessary. Yeah, that's 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 what I thought about the cloud image especially because you're paying. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, that's the idea. There is of course some trigger trigger between it, you have to then start to trust the host you're running on for DNS using the, the local host hack. Because because you're outsourcing the trust of your DNS from within the container, so in theory you're vulnerable to the host compromise. So I mean, but in well, the case you're outsourcing your computation, if you're already outsourcing your computation, yeah. storage, network, right. Right. so like they can just do anything they want with you in your little container. Right. But ha having the lo local validating resolver on the host, I think it makes sense to have, have it there. So yeah, we need, on the container host. Can you define? Yeah, exactly. Can you define cloud image? Because yeah. Cause, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of cloud base image, which is just like a disk image that you boot. And then like you mentioned a thousand different versions of it running, which makes me think you're talking about a Docker image. Right. So yeah. which, what are we talking about? So I'm talking about the cloud image that gets turned into the AMI. OK, the, OK. Uh, rack space. But there would be a thousand different versions running if you include it in that? Yeah, because, well, in a, in like a normal cloud deployment, you run anywhere between you know 100 and 10 servers, and it doesn't necessarily make sense because a lot of cloud providers provide like network isolation. And you get control over mm -hmm. you, can, okay. uh, you get control over DHCP, so you can run your own. So with, with each VM instance you're talking about, it would run not yeah. necessarily if okay. containers were running on top of the VM. I, I, well, I think okay. that for the cloud image, if you're already spinning up your image in like an AWS or a rack space, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to include the trusted resolver there because if you want a trusted resolver, there's a more efficient way of doing that 
external to the image mm -hmm. by dealing with like the network config around it. Okay. In like your DVC or your rack space that it's like private that keep uh, mm -hmm. the development stack is looking at providing DNS as a service as one of the components. Yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. Uh, designate? Yeah. Yeah. And so I just think that including in the cloud image doesn't make a lot of sense because then you've got a bunch of these DNS uh, instances running inside of an environment you already control the DNS for if you want. And it's just wasteful on the and just, yeah. yeah, and you're paying for CPU. Like you, don't, you don't want to run a thousand of them on even from one piece of hardware. Yeah, and so I don't think it makes sense for cloud image, but for like go on server or well, you, um, you mentioned Atomic Host. Yeah. You say it does make sense there, or it doesn't? Well, because okay. like we currently do Atomic Host for bare metal and Atomic Host for cloud, and right now they're kind of the same bits almost. Well, so. But but like for Atomic Host, like it kind of, if if you're gonna be spinning up containers, you're probably not gonna be spinning. Like if you're just doing a pure VM environment then you might be spinning up, you know, a thousand VMs because each one of your microservices is in its own VM or something like that. But if you're spinning up containers on top of a VM, you're probably, each of your VMs is going to be a bigger VM. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're almost using the, the container host is becoming like a second VM. It's becoming your infrastructure as a service. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. you run fewer really beefy atomic hosts even if you were running them in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it would be less, way, less wasteful for running them down there. Okay. Um, just because for the number of tenants you're serving, like the point of containers is you can serve way more tenants on the same hardware mm -hmm. without the overhead of doing VMs. Yeah. And so I feel like for the cloud image, if you're just using the cloud image and not hosting containers, you're going to be running a lot of them because that's probably how you're separating them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whereas that's with true. the atomic host, like, you're sharing it between a lot more instances of whatever. Gotcha. That's a theory of this. Yeah. And people and so it seems like it makes sense for atomic host on the bare metal, but it doesn't make well, sense. No. Much sense for he's saying he's saying it depends on where you divide the services, right? Because right? mm -hmm. if you're doing it with just with a traditional cloud image, then you're probably going to spin up a ton of those cloud images to do their own things. Yeah. But if you do it on Atomic Host, even if Atomic Host is hosted in the same cloud situation, you're probably breaking up a bunch of different containers on top of that Atomic Host. So you would only have one DNSSEC resolver yeah. on that Atomic Host for a lot of different services versus in the traditional cloud case where you probably have a bunch of different VM instances and each of them have their own resolver. You might have 10, you know, 10 Atomic Hosts with 100 containers each. So you're only running 10 instances of, of Unbound, whereas if you were doing pure VMs, you would have 1,000 VMs, so you only have 1,000 instances of Unbound. Yeah, like it has some implications on its own to have the Unbound there. It can save some, you know, by caching, it can save some time and, and bandwidth, but it is still running there, so it's consuming uh, memory and CPU time, so. Yeah, because if you're running like in a, in a standard cloud environment, you're running your, you know, one web server with maybe some, like, some worker processes or whatever, and then you're running one unbound for every instance of your web server, that doesn't make as much sense as running 100 web servers and 100 containers all sharing that same. Yeah, I agree. Because the process can do its own DNS caching if you're, on, if you're just you know, single host, and that's not a big deal because you've got a bunch of processes you can take advantage. So, so I think the like if the email was yeah I will reply with this to the mailing list I was working right. on this one this morning but I just have not gotten around to it in the right. session okay yeah I mean not having it known anything really about DNSSEC much before this uh, is what we have now kind of an, an in between step before the larger infrastructure gets in place for DNSSEC. Mm -hmm. uh, and at what point in the future does the current implementation go away. Right. Ideally, so like you keep the DNS resolver on the local host forever. Forever? Yeah, because it does caching for the whole machine. Okay. Anyway, you don't want to have caching every single application like it happens now. Like Firefox does caching, it is a network, main works Firefox does. Well, I know I system I saw Leonard talk recently about something similar to this where Yeah. 
He didn't yeah. want each application to do its own caching of DNS, so there was some system D service. System D resolved yeah, resolved. Doing, doing some tunneling of DNS over DBus back and forth. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's, 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 hard, it's hard to sort everything out, like, and understand, like. Well, you know, the DNS protocol that works on port 53 and it can. Yeah, marshalling DNS. A lot of us. <laughs> marshalling DNS into any other format seems to be the. It's a yeah. well understood format, yeah. just running over port 53. Mm -hmm. And um, Resolve D doesn't support uh, DNSSEC yet. And from when I was told and from what I discussed with them or asked them, uh, they are trying to, to do or they are planning some kind of best effort DNSSEC. So we are trying to do all those fallback mm -hmm. options like uh, trying to do the full recursion or tunnel DNS over TCP. But they, their plan is not to do any of those fallbacks. So, if the network provided DNS servers don't support DNSSEC, they will just turn it off and. Yeah, that, that works. So, hmm. so we is not is only working on Luca? Uh, yes. Okay. Because I have a new setup that has previously gone on interfaces. So, yeah. That's going to be an issue. Actually, it so works pretty nicely also with with uh, uh, Weird Manager, and yeah. I'm uh, like running three instances of DNS mask for uh, for uh, VMs, and yeah. then then I have like unbound running and yeah, it just works. Yeah, because it on on the loopback having named the listing on the port that it's serving it, it's serving up for with the VMs from the integration. Right? Yeah, but out of the box names uh, uh, config file. Yeah, to work out the box. Well, it needs to be uh, it needs to exclude the rules. It's just a small I think the and more specific it, bind will yeah, win. Exactly. So unbound will yeah. take local host and name will take anything that's not. That's the whole thing. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, but for, for example, bind in default configuration in Fedora, it's also listening on local host, so it would conflict. Well, that, that's because it's still listening to interfaces that are up. It will actually listen on the any, any interface that's up. Actually, actually by, actually by policy, right? we ship like a default configuration with bind. Yeah, it's Fedora policy that you're not allowed to, for default, listen on public IP. So if you install the daemon that listens, it has to be on the local. Right. Unless you manually reconfigure it. And we don't want, you know, to. No, I'm just thinking the, the default config file, if somebody was just going to enable and turn it on, it would. Yeah, well, just yeah, you can install two DNS servers. Well, yeah, uh, like yeah. One's, 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 one's up factory installed and then was optional, and the person yeah. installing needs to be aware of that's already there. Yes. That's I'm trying to prevent users from shooting themselves in the foot off this. Right, oh, yeah. No, they will do it. They will do it. No, it's not a problem. It's just a slide. Let's hope the DNS like I'm afraid of knowing nothing about the DNS. You know, nobody's. Who's going to miss the upgrade? <laughs> we don't want to have like more open resolvers on the internet and you know to help with uh, denial of service attacks and stuff like that. They'll, they'll be asked, ask Fedora post, and, and mm -hmm. someone will be like, this is what's going on, and then they'll just be uploaded to the top. It'll just be stuck there forever. <laughs> So, so back to the split view DNS. Uh, so you're saying that that's going to work um, out of the box if you have network manager configured um, correctly for your VPN? Because in a lot of cases right now, I'm just setting up DNS mask uh, myself manually, setting it back to your resolve comp to point the local host, and then setting the domains for the remote end of the right. VPN. Right. If the v if VPN provides all the domains, mm -hmm. like for example, if I connect to Red Hat VPN, it provides like Red Hat .com right. and some set of DNS servers. DNS mask automatically configures unbound to forward like varies from D uh, Red Hat.com to those to that set of DNS servers and for everything else it uses different so, so, so it depends on your upstream VPN configuration though because yeah. some VPNs don't by default give you DNS. Okay. And but if you do set it in local manager, so the no, it no, 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 And yeah. also the Depends yeah. on the type of VPN you are using because if the VPN implementation is not communicating with Network Manager, we are fetching all the information from Network Manager. So yeah. if Network Manager is not aware of your VPN, then we will not configure it. So if you no, use but, but, 
but currently some VPN solutions do it directly with yeah, that. Like yeah, no, no, like, like, like you you some, but also I think OpenVPN does If you get the right. Cisco VPN, you will find that it, it has a kernel model that blocks a result that count and then no, it's 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 horrible things. So yeah. you mean the Cisco VPN yeah. software? Yeah, to, to force you to have all the resolution no. through the VPNs, it does bad tricks. You mean the proprietary software? Yeah, yeah and it can okay. continue yeah. running tables yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah. 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 people have. Yeah. So it's not necessary. You actually, can just yeah. use the yeah. stock IPsec software, which works fine. Could you use Cisco. another one like Juniper or yeah, Juniper the Cordell's Norton network have their own clients? And anything can happen. But you don't need those. Are, those are all RFC compliant IPsec, yeah. right? You can just install no. it. Yeah. Only if you don't use any special feature, but they have all their own special feature worked on if you have the client and then... I've been running a lot of VPNs. Yeah, but I've seen situations where the, they, they're not allowed to patch with their standard client. They have to use that one because it's that specific feature. Sometimes it's corporate policy yeah. too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 corporate <laughs> policy is allowed to allow Fedora and then mandate <laughs> if I bring all the other yeah. VPN software. Okay. <laughs> Um, so there's one limitation currently to the um, to DNS. You can only actually get one domain currently because the, uh, for, the for the IP second one because I only supports one. Okay, so one. So this um, we're working on a draft together with Apple to actually extend this to be a list of multiple ones. Right, but that's the limitation of the VPN software. Yeah, right. in inverse case where, like for instance, uh, I go with a customer and they've got their domain um, locally that's attached to you know Ethernet or whatever, uh, but I actually want to do all of my resolution on that road end and only do the resolution for one domain on the VPN service or the non VPN. So, so you want the local resolver to only on one domain and everything else go through the VPN? Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you configure your VPN to be used for all, for everything. Okay, like for something for the... No, I, I mean like in network measure. Mm -hmm. uh, when I conf I'm conf configuring VPN, I can like uh, check mm -hmm. the box to use the VPN only for resources from that network. Mm -hmm. So if I don't check the box, um, network measure will prefer that VPN over any other connection. So it will be the default connection from our point of view and we are not distinguishing uh, like between if it's VPN or just wired network. So but then you will configure how do you use the local name? Right, yeah. You need yeah. to treat the local connection as a VPN as well. So if there are domains connected to the local connection then because they do all kinds of weird stuff. But the local uh, VPN is that domain. So you have the domain thing in the yeah. domain. Actually we are if your configuring VPN is over default route, then you're basically Isolating your laptop from your local network, and you're only connecting to the VPN. That's that's what it means. When yeah, you exactly. Say the local line. The local line is still connected to the local line. It doesn't take over the local line. Really. So, so, so it does actually. Uh, if you do zero by zero, it takes over everything. That's the problem. So, <laughs> so currently we are configuring <laughs> forward zones cool. for yeah. any, you know, like uh, domains provided by the wired connection. So, yeah. so it would be configured. But if there's like conflict in domains, so the VPN provided the same domain that the wired connection is providing, the VPN would be preferred. Okay. Yeah, it would only be for probably their somewhat fake um, TLD that they create for um, on their local resources. Actually, we, we have some like uh, own own solution to, for the situation where you connect to, to wired network, mm -hmm. but the network provided DNS servers are not able to provide you all the DNSSEC data. So you, in the end, you you would not use them, but uh, there may be like uh, they may have different internal view of some zone, mm -hmm. but so for the internal domains you you want to use them anyway. So uh, we have like a module for unbound okay. that can be configured with different set of name servers. So if the response from the internet was insecure, basically meaning that the domain is not signed mm -hmm. because we don't want to downgrade the security uh, the module would ask the different set like local okay. dns servers for for the answer so kind of like what you could do for an extra domain if it's a local on their zone, or the yeah zone you, you try the internet if like you get signed answer mm -hmm. you trust the signed answer if you get unsigned answer you will try also to ask also those like local servers because they cannot tell you or provide you any side answer for sure. Okay. 
So if you would ask them like for every answer, you would downgrade the security basically. Okay. Question: Can you in a, in a in your own environment can you have a subdomain that is explicitly not signed, even though your root to the main is signed, and then in such a way that the client knows that it is not signed by willing to so, so you can actually ask queries that will then the sex will not be there, but yeah, but by in such a way that there is no proof that this not, this doesn't exist for you. Um, so you would. You so I think a lot of people that might want to enable DNSSEC, think about Reddit.com or Fedora Party or whatever, they may want to have everything signed, but they might have a corp temp whatever subdomain where, you know, it's kind of far west and they don't want to sign that because... Right. And you don't want to, I don't like, want to publish the... I don't for that specific subdomain and only find request, but I don't want to have any other invented subdomain to actually... Right, but you don't want to have like a delegation or anything uh, for, for that subdomain. Or well, maybe I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah, like you, you, you can delegate that subdomain to. Right. Also to the same like uh, set of servers, but right. uh, and not uh, having the so-called DS record, like delegated signer, and by not including the, <coughs> the record for that delegated domain, you are saying that the domain is not signed, basically. But you said you know that the domain actually exists. Yeah. But it exists, but it's not signed okay. because. But you can also use NSEC3 with opt out, and everything opt out is actually not uh, covered. So anything could exist in a range that is impaired. So you can actually have your your you know, hidden domain name that is still. No, it doesn't so have to be hidden, just not signed for whatever reason. Yeah, like I, I want to be able to say, oh, this is a not signed subdomain. But, but okay, yeah. and this is a non-existing. You have to take action to actually say the sure. subdomain is signed. Yeah. So if you don't take any action, for definition, it yeah. remains unsigned. As long as you delegate that, because the other yeah. service does that. Then. Yes, because if if it's part of the same zone, it has to be signed or not signed at all. So because you cannot like uh, have half signed uh, zone. I think yeah, yeah. it would be common to find things like that because yeah, like how half signed zone. X Y Z does bullshit thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Half side zone doesn't yeah. is not technically possible because you are including uh, also the proof of non-existence of some names. So right. it would be then like so you silly. have to explicitly acknowledge that unsigned subdomain. Yeah, exists, and you can you can you will get like a proof of non-existence of DS records for that subdomain, and by that you know that is not signed basically because there is no such record. So you are not able to build chain of trust. Yeah. Do you know what the status of DNSSEC in our distro? Is it very special or...? Like, to be honest, we are the only ones, based on the like, uh, DNSSEC trigger mailing list, we are the only ones contributing to, to the <laughs> project, but... Uh, there is FreeBSD, which now for default installs Unbound, but they've sort of ignored all the hotspot problems. I guess they, they don't have much of a laptop market. <laughs> they're, they're mostly server. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so they install so they do install it for default. So it is the default DNS server for them with validation. Yeah. They they are they don't know what fun they are missing on the you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think they store exactly what fun they're missing. Yeah. They're not happy to be missing. Yeah. If you install a bind in Debian explicitly, then it has DNS by default, but it's not installed by default. No, if Everybody installs and any of the DNS for default. If you install bind or unbound or and also in Fedora, they all they all come with DNS enabled. But but then then you have then the going in the yeah. Yeah. yeah, but then then you have problems like uh, ideally you want to use network provided uh, name servers if possible. Right. So I mean, you're not set up to use it, but it's there. Right. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. Yeah. As for the as far as for the like server side, like by server side, I mean. Bind when you install bind unbound. Just to do the resolution, DNSSEC is enabled everywhere, every time. So it should, should work. But if you want to use it on a mobile laptop, you have problems because you can connect to to network where all outgoing uh, DNS communication to the internet is blocked, and then you are screwed if you don't configure unbound correctly, like to tunnel co the communication or to use the local. Name servers. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for coming and.